so much for joining us here at Faith Church. We are so glad you chose to be with us this morning. Our goal as a church is for you to know God, grow together, discover your purpose, and make a difference. Part of that involves Sunday morning services, but we also have lots of other ways for you to get involved. Not only do we have ministries where you can serve and make a difference in our city, but we also have tons of small groups full of amazing people just like you who are looking for an authentic community where they can grow with one another. To find a group near you, just head over to faithishere.org slash groups. To follow along with notes and scriptures, we encourage you to download the YouVersion app on your smartphone. Tap the More tab, then Events, and select your campus. Thanks again for being with us today. If you have any questions, just look for someone with the Dream Team lanyard and they'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Service will be starting momentarily, so grab a seat and get ready to hear from God's Word. grateful for your presence. We're grateful for your presence. We're thankful that we are allowed to come into your presence with thanksgiving, with praise, with a grateful heart. So God, receive the reward of your suffering. We love you. Get it off of my freedom upon the hill where mercy fell. Come on, let's sing. And on that day, and on that day you won the war once and for all. You tore the veil. And sing it all you. And no, you never fail, and you never will. Come on, let's declare it out. We are free. We are free. We are healed. We are saved by the blood, by the blood. Every fear, all the shame is replaced. Come on, church.
his love this morning. Yes, Lord, we thank you for your love. Come on, right now, just begin to declare who God is. Just say, God, you're faithful. Begin to lift a sound of worship. Say, God, you're worthy. Say, God, you're holy.
church. Whether you're here today or you're watching with us online, a lot of us find ourselves this morning in a dead-end job. We find ourselves in a dead-end marriage. We find ourselves in a dead-end relationship. Maybe we find ourselves in a dead-end health situation. But I want to let you know what you see with the physical eyes does not tell you the truth of the situation that you're in. Because in a way that looks like there's no way, I know a way maker that can make a way. And he's in the house this morning. He's in the house this morning. You see, it's not about songs that we sing, it's about the truth that we declare. And sometimes we gotta declare something before we believe something and before we see something. And so this morning, if you're in the room and you're like, there's a situation going on in my life or somebody I know and it feels like there's no answer, like there's no hope, Man, let's right now, let's take a few seconds and let's just reach out to the God that can make a way where there seems to be no way. Just lift your hands to the Lord. Just begin with your own words. Just declare, say, God, you are good. God, I choose to believe that you are a healer. God, I choose to believe that you are a provider. I choose to believe that you are a way maker, that you love me, that you see my situation. God, we come before you right now, God. And God, we just say thank you, God, for the way that you're about to make in somebody's life this morning. God, I thank you for the healing that's gonna break out in this room this morning, Lord God. God, I thank you for the marriages that are gonna be mended this morning. God, I thank you, Lord God, for the job opportunities that's coming for somebody right now, Lord God. God, I thank you, Lord God, for the person that's lost all hope, Lord God, that they're about to experience joy for the first time in a long time this morning because you're in the room. And God, we choose, God, to set our eyes upon you, not upon our, our road, and not upon our situation, but upon the one that can make our path straight. Jesus, we invite you into this place. We invite you into our lives. And God, in faith, we say thank you for what you're about to do. Because God, what you're about to do is greater than anything we could have hoped for or dreamt up. Father, I just thank you, God, that this morning you're about to do something amazing in this place. So Father, as, I, as we move throughout the rest of this service, Holy Spirit, we ask that you come and you speak to us. I pray that as the word is brought forth, that you would anoint our hearts, our minds, our ears, so that we could receive the word, that we could leave this place not, in, not entertained, but we leave this place changed. So Father, we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Amen. Can we make some noise for Jesus this morning? Just say thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in my life. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to church this morning. My name is Pastor Tim. I'm the next gen director here at Faith Church. And on behalf of Pastor Larry and Jeannie, I want to say welcome to all of our first time guests. Church, can we welcome our first time guests today? Man, we're so honored that you decided to join us today. We don't take that honor lightly. So today, after the service in our lobbies, we have a Connect Center. We have some awesome people there that are just waiting there just to meet you, give you a gift. Um, uh, learn your name, hear your story. And so make sure you check it, uh, check that out um, today as well. But hey, this is my favorite time of service. This is the time where we get to be a community, get to be a family. And so take the next like 10, 15, 20 seconds and give some socially distanced high fives. Tell some people, we, um, hey, check in with them. My name is Pastor Tim, and we're so glad that you have decided to join us today. Hey, I just want to let you know that there's something awesome going on here at Faith Church, and it's called Growth Track. How many of you guys have gone through Growth Track or when it was called Life Point? I would just put your hand up. See, Growth Track is an amazing opportunity for you to learn more about who God is, who we are as a church, and who you are and how God's equipped you to be a part of the body of Christ. And so, man, what I want to encourage you to do is right now, actually, uh, growth Track Week 4 is taking place in the Growth Track room out in the lobby to the right. But next week, we start back up with Week 1 of Growth Track. So make sure you check that out. You get plugged in. It's a great way to meet people, learn more about God, 
about Faith Church and how you can be involved in what the Lord is doing. So during this time, what we usually do is we pass the baskets, we take our tithes and offerings. But during this season, what we're doing is at the end of service, our ushers are waiting at the doors and they have the basket so you can give on your way out. Um, but what I wanna do is I just wanna take this opportunity as the next gen director to look at you all in the face and say thank you for giving. Because when you give, you give to Kingdom Builders. And Kingdom Builders, it equips missionaries around the world and locally, but also it gives to the next generation. And because of your giving, we are seeing this next generation reached for Jesus Christ. So many people have written off this generation. God has a plan for this generation. And because of your partnering with God financially, we are seeing amazing things take place. Um, so just uh, yesterday, our, at our Hispanic campus, our Faith Students Ministry, they baptized 12 students yesterday. Y'all better get more excited than that. 12 students got baptized yesterday. So exciting. So I just want to say thank you for being so generous because of what you do. We are reaching this next generation. Can we pray over this morning's tithes and offerings? Father, thank you so much for the way that you so generously pour out your love and your grace and your mercy to us every single day. And Father God, I pray that God, you would do something within our hearts to God. We would be the type of people that would generously respond to your generosity. And God, we would give you our best in all things. So God, I pray that you would take this offering this morning, that you would multiply it, and God, you would do only what you can do with it, which is a miracle. In Jesus' name, amen. on August 28th at 7 p.m. at Faith Somerville. Everything's provided, so you don't need to worry about anything. We just want you to come, enjoy some time of fellowship and worship together. For more information, you can call Pastor Sam and Diane at 473-761-4544. We hope to see you then. Guys, Family Fist Sunday is next week. Every fifth Sunday of the month, we love to celebrate with our elementary kids. They will join us for worship before returning to the kids area for service and fun. This time allows adults to show how fun and how great worship can be. Before you bring your kids to service, we are asking that you get their security tags by checking them in. This will be an amazing service that you don't want to miss. The Somerville Area Ministerial Association will be hosting their first Friday Unity service on September 4th in Hutchison Square beginning at 6 p.m. Pastor Larry is bringing a message on unity as we come together in prayer. Don't forget to wear your mask. We will be practicing social distancing at this event. We're so excited to see you September 4th, 6 p.m. at Hutchinson Square. We'll see you then. faith. This is Cyril Prabhu. I'm the founder of Proverbs 26. I'm here this morning to talk to you about one of the opportunities that we have in Proverbs 26. Many of you know this is a program that helps children whose parents are in prison. This program is called Kids to College. This allows us to get into the lives of these children as they are entering into the ninth grade. And we would be staying with them for four years of their high school days and that we would help them not only to stay in school but also prepare them for the college. Here's how you can participate. If you have a tug in your heart, visit us at proverbs26.org slash kids to college. And you want more information about it? Send us an email to kids to college at proverbs26.org. Thank you for listening to us this morning. 
Faith Church, we are excited for this opportunity to grow our partnership with Proverbs 226 as we connect spiritual mentors from our congregations to the Kids to College program. As a mentor, you will undergo efficient training from Proverbs 226, be matched with a child in the program, and will virtually meet with them for around an hour a month as you build a relationship alongside their academic mentors and help them to see the love of Jesus. Please sign up in the lobby of your campus today. Sometimes what you need is just connected to just showing up. God takes care of the results. He takes care of the growth. Just show up. I'm not talking about just church attendance, but here's the problem. We compartmentalize the priority and the importance of being connected to the body of Jesus Christ. And one of the main expressions in that is the gathering of his saints, the gathering of his children in a service just like this. And we think, I don't got to go to show up to that. And you're wondering why you're struggling. And God is just saying, just show up. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Student Takeover Sunday. We're so excited. Um, and so I just got to give you a few uh, updates on some amazing things. So just a couple months ago in our student ministries here at Faith, we had our uh, Faith students, our student ministries were a part of four of our 11 campuses. But God's been up to something amazing uh, in spite of COVID and everything. With back to school coming up, we now have Faith students um, ministry at nine of our 11 campuses. And so we are reaching teenagers in so many more uh, of the cities in the low country. We're so excited um, for what's going on. Uh, young adults, if you're between the age of 18 to 30 years old, next Monday night at 7 p.m. here, Building 6, we are gonna be chasing after Jesus. And we're gonna be a powerful time of worship. We have an amazing guest speaker. There's gonna be an after party, so there's gonna be a time of community. And so you're gonna make sure you're gonna to wanna to be here for that. But hey, tonight is the start of something big here at Faith Church. Tonight is student conference, okay? So this is what I want everybody to do. Say six. Okay, so it starts at 6 p.m. tonight. And then Monday and Tuesday, everybody say seven. It starts at seven, okay? And so we're gonna be, like I said, we're going after Jesus. We're gonna see the Holy Spirit move in this next generation. We're gonna see hundreds of students come, give their lives to Jesus, and we're gonna plug them in and get connected into a healthy, Christ-centered community. So be praying for us if you are a student. Man, you better be there. If you, if you have a student, you better make sure that they're there. And if you know a student, you better tell them about it because it's about to be the most amazing thing uh, that's about to take place in the low country. I'm so excited. We've been praying and fasting. We're going to see God move in crazy ways. But we are so blessed today because Pastor Larry said, hey, you got student conference going on? Let's just make it student takeover Sunday, which means we have the student worship team up here this morning. Our, our middle school and high school pastor, Pastor Shatir, he will be in the lobby after service at the faith students table. If you have any questions or you want to serve, can I get an amen? Go talk to him um, after service. But this morning, we are also so blessed to have our guest speaker for student conference speaking this morning. Y'all, he shut it down in the first service, okay? And so God is about to do something amazing. He is a dear friend of mine and somebody that I am proud to say uh, is a part of what God is about to do here at Faith. So will everybody stand up on their feet and make some noise and welcome my friend, Pastor Gabriel Zamora. Come on, are you excited to be here? Say yes. I said, if you're excited to be here, say yes. Are you excited to be in church? Say yes. Do you love your pastor? Say yes. Do you love Jesus more? Say yes. I said, do you love Jesus more? Say yes. Before you're seated, because I want to honor the father of this house and, and the, the pastors here, Pastor Larry, thank you so much for having me up here. I never, ever take it lightly. I promise you, um, God, deal with me if I ever feel like I'm worthy of this, and I just take it with such reverence to be able to communicate God's word and that you would trust your people with me. Thank you so much. Now, what I want you to know, church, is that you've inherited, um, in my opinion, which it's a pretty qualified opinion because I get to travel all over the country and meet next-gen directors. In my qualified opinion, if I could humbly say that, you have one of the greatest couples in next-gen ministry in the nation, in, in Tim and Tina Smith. Amen. While you're standing, can we just pray? 
Dear Heavenly Father, I just come before you. I pray that we would grow in the knowledge and revelation of Jesus Christ. God, help me to move out of the way. Lord, just make my tongue like the pen of a ready writer. Lord, I pray that I would just be a clear conduit, that you would just flow. In Jesus' name, we give you the agenda for this service. And because I am Latino, I pray that that clock in the back would stop. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. If you're not signed up for student conference, young person, what are you doing? Let me tell you what you're doing. Nothing. You don't have school tomorrow. You don't have sports. Hello. There's no honors, homework, so let's just mitigate all the excuses. And parent, if you're afraid of... Of, of, of them gathering together, I would just say this, like it, it's high time that we just, we're, we're going to take all the precautions, we're going to do everything that we can to make sure that it's a safe environment, but I just believe that an encounter with God is worth getting out of the house, and I just believe that this generation is not the future of the church, they are the church. If we post-date their inclusion in the kingdom of God, we will inevitably allow, allow them to remain immature. But if we include them in the expression of the kingdom of God, that we are all expressions of the kingdom of God from the cradle to the grave, then we will have to come to the conclusion that God just doesn't want to use them when they're 18 or when they pay their tithes or when they're married or when they sow their wild oats. But God wants to use young people right now. Do you believe that? Say yes. So if you're a grandparent, you're a mom, you're a dad, you need to sign up your young person online if you're watching this and you this, the rain scared you. Let me look at you. First of all, you have hurricanes in South Carolina. How did the rain scare you? But if you're watching online, just want to say welcome, but get your young people here. I just There's not a replacement for an authentic encounter with God. And, and I believe that's going to happen this week. Um, so I'm so excited. But today, oh, I know that we have a, also have a Portuguese uh, people watch us, estamos juntos, eu te amo, I just told them I'm with you, I love you, just so you guys all know, um, for all my Brazilian, if any of the Brazilians want to take me to steak at some point, I love picanha, so, sorry, that was second service, you find rabbit trails, um, love you, uh, Portuguese uh, church, and just want to, if I speak fast, I am so sorry for the translator, um, I'm a fast talking Mexican, what can I say? But uh, you have two ears to my one mouth, so let's listen faster. Amen? Today I'm going to talk about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God that has never, ever been thwarted. It's never been defeated. It's never, uh, it's never suffered a loss. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God that though a culture would try to say this is dominant thought, it's a subversive kingdom that may not always look like it's the dominant. It may not be the Republican way, the Democratic way, the independent way, but it is the way, right? The kingdom of God. That was a great place to say amen. The kingdom of God. Now, we've all been in a storm. This is what's so unique and peculiar about 2020. They're usually in a room like this, you would have a myriad of experiences. You would have some people going through legitimate trauma, and you'd have others going through trial, and you would have other, others experiencing real joy. And, and here's, the, here's the unique moment that we are in in 2020, and that's this, that we are all in a storm. We're in different boats, so our experiences vary, but we're all in a storm. None of us are impervious to 2020. None of us are impervious to being affected by the results and consequence of COVID-19. Whether it's job loss, it's job difficulty, it's being at home with your kids. How many of you were ready to homeschool? Two of you. The rest of us were like, grace and mercy, please, God. We've all been affected. We're all in this storm. We're in different boats, but we've all been in the storm. And I just don't believe that God is in heaven feeling insecure and at this moment just occurred to him. He's not sitting up there, Jesus, at the right hand of the Father with his knees in fellowship. Oh, God, what are we going to do? No, he's up there knowing that before the sands of time, I have had a plan. Before the, the, before the lines were drawn and the human experience began to happen, I already had a plan. And in fact, that plan has happened from eternity past. The scriptures say that a lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. So he, he, before, this is a crazy, before he had ever created anything, he had already justified it and glorified it. Put that in our intellectual mind, try to wrap it around. You're confused. Me too. 
That's how he, I don't know how he did that. But that's got the kingdom of God. So the title of my sermon tonight is The Power of the Seed. The kingdom always starts off in seed form. In fact, if Jesus was on earth today to have one message, he might become redundant to you. He would, as an itinerant speaker, you might be frustrated. You might have had your favorite evangelist growing up, and they'd come in and have revivals. How many of you ever been to a revival? And those evangelists usually preach the same five messages. Well, don't judge them. Jesus only preached one, and it was the kingdom. He didn't preach the gospel. He preached the kingdom. He preached the kingdom. He illustrated it in different ways, but he preached one message. Say one. And that was the kingdom. And so today we're going to talk about one way in which he illustrated the kingdom in Mark chapter 4. Two ways in which he illustrated it is with the seed. So the title of today's sermon is the power of the seed. Write that down if you're taking notes. If you're taking notes, you are ten times more likely to go to heaven, but the choice is yours. <laughs> the power of the seed. Two points, two different parables about seed, talking about one kingdom. If you will, find yourselves in your Bible with me in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 32. Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 32. I heard this church loves the Bible. If you believe that, say yes. I love the Bible. I love the Bible. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will last forever. Amen. Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 32. Uh, I am a graduate student and a Bible nerd. And so in Bible college, they, and they make me read out of different translations. But today, I'm going to read out of the NLT because that's the New Latino translation. <laughs> Verse 26. Jesus also said the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Say seed. Night and day while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows. But he does not understand how it happens. Say doesn't understand. The earth produces the crops on its own. Say on its own. First, the leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally, the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. Second parable about the kingdom. Jesus said, how can I describe the kingdom of God? What story should I use to illustrate it? It's like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It's the smallest, say smallest. I need you to help me second service because first service was, they were lit. Let me translate for all the old people. They were in it. They were hyped. They were excited. They were jovial. Little gregarious. <laughs> say smallest. Small. Of all seeds, but it becomes the largest, say largest. Small. Of all garden plants, it grows long branches and birds can make nests in its shade. Two parables about one kingdom, both talking about seed. If you allow me, if you're familiar with church, and sometimes familiarity can really hurt us because we've heard these scriptures and read through the gospels maybe a number of times. So if you're familiar with church and you're in a word church like this that really digs into the Bible, I would just ask you if you would journey with me and not make assumptions or assertions on what you think I'm already going to say and what this text already means. Is that, is that okay? Say, I got it. Two points, if you allow me to take out of this, two thoughts quickly about the kingdom of God being illustrated by seed. Number one, it can't be stopped. Say, can't be stopped. Number two, it starts small. Say, starts small. Number one, it can't be stopped. Let me just have an agricultural uh, conversation with you. I don't have a green thumb. I don't grow a garden. I'm not like a farmer uh, by any stretch of the imagination. However, I understand this thing about seed, that if I planted an orange seed, I would get an orange tree. If I planted an apple seed, I would get an apple tree. In other words, seeds can only produce fruit after their own kind. You are not crossing species. Now, this follows the order of creation in Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, when God says this after creating the, the animals and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. He says, and they all produced after their own kind. They all produced after their own kind. So in a room like this where I see diversity and different ethnic shades i got my chocolate up in the house somebody say glory i got my vanilla up in the house somebody say amen and i got i got my caramel up in the up in the house say glory salsa you know merengue we we you know we got caramel we got we got ethnic diversity but we're all the human race producing after our own kind Seed can only produce after its own kind. Now, the mystery of the fruit is that it's in the seed. The mystery of that tree is that it was once in the seed. And the mystery of that seed is now that it's in the fruit. 
It's a, it's a mysterious thing. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we find the first messianic prophecy in all of the Bible. Big theological word that just means the first foretelling or, or prediction of the Savior, of King Jesus, of, of God coming to earth to right the wrongs that were made what, and to do for ma humanity what humanity could not do on their own. In the first mistake in the Bible, he closed them. It's a message all by itself. In his judgment where we would say he expelled them from Eden. No, 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 no. He gave them grace so that they would one, one day die and ultimately be brought with him in salvation for eternity. Because if they lived in that place and ate of the tree of life, they would have lived forever in separation. It was still grace. You ever had your mama whoop you? That was grace. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. God begins to tell Eve and the serpent something and he starts this narrative this way. I'm going to create enmity, strife, war, conflict. We ain't going to like each other. I'm going to create enmity between your seed and between her seed and your seed. And his seed is going to bruise your, 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 your offspring's heel, but your offspring is going to crush his offspring's head. Now, the Hebrew word there is zered. Say zered. Zered means seed. So I'm going to create enmity between your seed. I'm going to, his seed's going to crush or bruise your seed's heel. But your seed is going to crush his seed's head. Now God sowed a seed and said from Eve and from her womb, she would carry a seed that would pass through the corridors of time. That by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6 and all of humanity has lost its mind. And through a flood, he still preserves his seed, say seed. Then he begins to raise raise up a man by the name of Abraham, takes him through the di diaspora and being dispersed among the land and carries the seed, say seed. And then you continue to work your way through the book of Genesis. And at the end of the book, you find that they are now in captivity and in slavery in Egypt, yet God still preserves his seed, say seed. You continue to follow through the books and through the, through the prophets and the judges and the kings, and you see that through prostitutes, through degenerates, through captivity, through exile, through failures, through people who were not supposed to be qualified, he still brings forth the seed, say seed. When you get to Isaiah chapter 11 verse 10, and then it says, through the root of Jesse, or the seed, will become the savior of the world. And then we find in Bethlehem an immaculate conception, in perfect purity, Mary births the seed of heaven and he comes forth and wraps himself in skin and Jesus of Nazareth touches the human experience in flesh. Say seed. That seed that was sown from Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, never defeated, never broken, never messed up by sin, never messed up by every woe that we could have accomplished on our own, and he shows up in the form of Jesus. Then Jesus, Jesus says this, prophesying of himself in John chapter 12 verse 24, unless a seed goes into the ground and dies, it cannot produce much fruit. Unless a seed goes into the ground and dies, it cannot produce much fruit. Unless a seed dies on Calvary, it cannot produce much fruit. Unless a seed goes into the ground in Golgotha, it cannot produce much fruit. Unless a seed is raised in resurrection power, it cannot produce much fruit. But this seed died for us. This seed seed was buried for us. The seed was raised again for us so that ultimately we would be the fruit of that seed. Is that good news? Say yes. Come on, faith church. Is that good news? Say yes. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 says this, he was the firstborn among the dead, a type of first fruits. And the mystery of the fruit is that it's in the seed. And the mystery now of the seed is that it's in the fruit. And the mystery about you and the mystery about me is this, Colossians 1 27, great is this mystery. Christ is in you the hope of glory. God sowed a seed and this kingdom can't be stopped. This kingdom is now your inheritance. This kingdom is now our experience. The gospel is not a future tense thing that we get when we go to heaven and we ultimately get fire insurance. The gospel is a reality that takes place in the present, a present kingdom that has actual effects on our everyday life. On our everyday life, do you believe that? But many times we believe Jesus died for us just 
but he didn't die as us. And I want to tell you this, Jesus didn't just die for you, he died as you. Let me explain. If Jesus just died for you, he's only merciful and he's only forgiving. Because by definition, for you to be free, I would have to free you from the very thing that enslaves you. The sinful, idamic, broken nature. Or else you're still just a slave. So he goes to the cross and he crucifies your old broken self. He crucifies and buries that brokenness that we inherited from Adam because a seed can only produce after its own kind. And if that's the seed that heaven sown, you, the fruit from that seed is not a sinful, broken, anxious, depressed, bro, uh, bro, broke, busted, and disgusted, can't even be trusted kind of fruit. Amen? But many times we believe more in the act of Adam than we do in the work of Christ. Let me explain. None of us would disagree that we live in a broken, fallen world because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Turn on CNN and Fox News. they both crazy. We live in a fallen world. No one would dispute that. But we don't believe that we live in a kingdom that actually has changed something. Romans chapter 5, verses 18 through 20 says, Through one man's act of disobedience, all have sinned. But through one man's act of righteousness, all have been given new life. Say all. all. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says this, That in Adam all have died, but in Christ he's become a life-giving spirit to all men. Say all. all. Say all men. All. Say all men. Because here's the reality, you and me were included in that seed that was sown, we were co-crucified on a cross, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me, and now I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20, for I have died and my life is now hidden in Christ, Colossians 3.3, I've been given all things for godliness according to the divine nature that lives on the inside of me, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, I have been been given all things for godliness according to the divine nature that lives on the inside of me the seed that was sown that I didn't sow that he sowed long before that seed gives me power to live godly according to that divine nature according to that divine nature because we were not born of perishable seed but of imperishable seed second Peter chapter 1 verse 23 imperishable seed the kingdom sowed a seed and it cannot be stopped and it always produces after its own kind. How many of you like to take pictures? How many of you like to take pictures? Me too. I'm horrible at it though. Like I'm the worst millennial ever. I love a good cup of coffee. Kind of makes me a millennial. I wear skinny jeans. Don't judge me old people. And But I can't take pictures well. Most millennials can. But I remember when you were, how many of you had the disposable cameras when you were, when you, how many of you are missing years and even possibly decades because you didn't get it developed at Walgreens? <laughs> Seriously. Those things were the devil. And then when you try to take pictures, you had to sit there and crank it. <laughs> how annoying, right? And then <laughs> finally, <laughs> you had to sit there and crank it. It's horrible. I don't know how you took pictures of your kids because I got a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old. Somebody say, mercy. And so to take pictures of them with a, with a disposable crank camera would be horrific. But then this invention happened called a Polaroid picture. This instantaneous film that created film like that. And so we take pictures, and the pictures are not always that good. They're kind of pixelated and grainy. They don't look that great. But these cameras are back in vogue. So young people, what they're doing is, and the film's pretty expensive too. So then they go and buy these Polaroid cameras. They take a picture of a Polaroid, a Polaroid picture, and then get their thousand plus dollar phone, jokes on you mom and dad, you bought it, and they get this, they get this crazy expensive phone with a bajillion megapixels, take a picture of the Polaroid picture, and post it on Instagram, does that make any sense, say no, does that make any sense, and they post, but you know what we all do when we get a Polaroid picture, we all do this, it's the crazy, watch someone take a picture of the Polaroid, and we start grabbing, we start shaking it, and you start blowing on it, you're trying to get it to develop. You're trying to get the colors to come around all the corners and make sure that you're helping it develop quicker because you're real anxious to see that picture because we got no patience. We're like, 
I want to see. I want to see. I want to make sure I need, if I need to take a, another one. And you're sitting there and you're shaking and you're shaking it and you're trying to partner with its development. But actually, Polaroid released an official statement that said you actually can make the colors blotch and really mess up the colors when you're shaking it and trying to blow on it like that. In fact, what you should do is take a picture of a Polaroid and you place it on a table and all on its own, it develops. And all on its own, it develops. We approach the kingdom of God in the same way. We say, my life is evidently my project and I got to partner with God in my transformation. And if I could just pray more, if I could just try more, if I could just, if I could just do this more, if I could just do that more, and we're trying to partner with, God's, with God in all of that he's trying to do in and through my life. But your life is not your project, nor is your transformation it's God's Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 it's by grace through faith that you've been saved and this is not of yourselves let me let you in on something the, the Christian faith rubs against the humanistic western ideology where it says that I got to make it all about God before he'll ever love me no, no 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 listen listen God made it all about you before you could ever make it all about him he made it all about you before you could ever make it all. He, but while we were still yet sinners, Christ died. This is how he demonstrates his love. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. He's been sowing into you before the sands of time, before you ever responded, before you ever stopped chewing and smoking and going with those who do. It ain't about all of that. And that's not, not that holiness doesn't matter. Listen, I live a holy life, but it's because I first receive self-control, not because I'm trying to produce it. Seed, say seed. Our life is not our project. It's re you know you can't fight anxiety. It's an oxymoron. If you fight anxiety, you only exasperate it. You only can release anxiety and trust that God can give you peace. In fact, Philippians chapter four, verses seven through eight says this: Don't be anxious for anything. Say anything, but in all things give thanks and make your Requests and supplication known to God, and then say, "Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall be yours." Let me let me tell you something. You can't fight anxiety; it will kick your tail every day of the week. But you can receive peace. You can't beat depression. If you start trying to look at yourself, you will only navel gaze so far as to find how inadequate we actually are. But we can receive joy. But we can receive joy. Listen, the kingdom of God, this is what it says in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 11, 10, verse 15. The kingdom of God should be received like a child, with trust, with innocence, knowing the one who gave it is good. When we receive this kingdom to really trust, to really rest, that God is the one who's transforming our lives. He's the one doing something from the inside out. When we receive that, then you actually see transformation. Because if we're trying to produce the fruits of the Spirit, they're your fruit. But they're not your fruit. They're the fruits of the Spirit. They're not Gabriel's fruit. They're the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. All of those nine different fruits there listed. Kindness, self-control, goodness, peace, joy, love, self-control. Against such there is no law. Those fruit are the fruits of seed that you did not sow. But that seed can only produce after its own kind. And that seed has been sown in your life. So the seed that you can now receive, you can't beat your addiction, but you can receive self-control. I'm not talking about an apathetic faith. I'm talking about a real trust in God. Listen, the gospel is not against, the gospel is against earning, but it's not against effort. It takes real effort to trust. It takes real effort to believe that God transforms you from the inside out. Do you believe that? Say yes. Rest, rest. Such a profound kingdom principle. In fact, the first, the two creations in the Bible happened while men were resting. There's one creation in the, in the book of Genesis in the beginning. And there's the second creation in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Behold, those of us who are in Christ Jesus are what? A new creation. We're new creations. So the first creation happens while Adam is asleep. The crescendo of creation, Eve, comes while he's asleep. He's resting. The second creation happens 
when Jesus is in Golgotha, he's sleeping for three days. New creation then is birth. And in fact, when he's birthed, he comes out and Mary believes he's the gardener until he says, Mary. And she turns and says, Rabboni. He's always been in the dirt. He's always been the gardener. He, he birthed out of the dirt, Eve, and, and out of the, the soil of the sand, Adam, and from Adam, Eve, and then from the soil of that sand, new creation, and through the body of Jesus Christ. You want to know why his wound is still open? Because he's not done creating his bride. You want to know why Adam was, was sewed up? Because Eve was already done and, and fulfilled. But, but Jesus is still building his church. He's still inviting people to be his bride. So the wounds are still open. He's still producing creation. But it happened while he was resting. Rest is the greatest pronouncement of faith you can ever make. Grace is the greatest pronouncement of faith that you could ever make. But you don't know what's happening to me. You don't know how much dirt's being thrown on me. I, can, I just can't take another thing. I can't go through another trial. Gabriel, you do not understand. I'm going through so much, and I would just tell you this. Listen, there's a reason why dirt is being thrown on you. It's because there's seed in you. It's not because God forgot about you. It's not because you've been forgotten, but because you've been planted. And from that germination, from that bacteria, God is producing life in and through you if your life was sterile and tranquil why we're sanitizing everything because we don't want a virus to grow but if you sanitize everything there is no life it's just sterile but God didn't call us to a sterile world he called us to a dirty one and he called us and he gave us a seed that was unstoppable and it can't be stopped second thing is it always starts small say start small how many of you are the baby in your family? Raise your hand. You see how there was more babies in second service? They don't like to get up early. Because you were never disciplined. My, my youngest brother has been whipped less times in his lifetime than I was whipped in one week. Spoiled, spoiled. Spoiled, say spoiled. How many of you are the middle child? I'm so sorry. You were forgotten about. We hardly have pictures of you. In fact, I feel so bad for the middle child. Why don't we just give him a round of applause, give him some love. How many of you are the oldest? Raise your hand. Pastor Larry. We got scars, bro. We had to go through inner healing for that stuff. My mama whooped me, and I was raised with a BMW, a big Mexican woman. I had a Beamer my whole life, BMW. I mean, this woman, do you guys still whoop kids in South Carolina? For those of you who are part of postmodernity and the new wave of psychological uh, help with your kids and the affirming of their identity, time out. But I got whooped with a myriad of different objects. Being the oldest was tough, man. Mira, mijo. You need to be an example to your brother. He's not an example to me. Mijo, ¿por qué? Why do you have a B in this class? I'm serious. I had straight A's and one B. She's asking about the B. And my brother has like C's and D's. It's, are you serious? Being the oldest is tough. But there's one thing that I took full advantage of being the oldest. It was my birthright. See my birthright. I took dominion over my younger brothers. I took dominion. It was my birthright. Say seed. I beat my younger brother every day. <laughs> Say every day. I beat him in pickup basketball. I beat him. We'd, we'd sign up for youth football. We'd put on our pads, do tackling drills in the front yard in the gravel of the apartment complex. I put his face in the dirt every time. Say every time. He never beat me at Madden. He never beat me at NBA Jam. I'm nice. I beat him every time. Say every time. I mean, I'll beat that boy. He better know it's my birthright to take dominion over you. You will never, ever take me on. Ever say ever. I mean, and we used to fight like real fight. Like not like young people fight today. Like that your, your kids or your young people get in a fight and you get all upset with your sibling and you go to your room and you shut the door. Wham! And you get on Instagram and Snapchat. My family, they're so unreasonable. I just can't wait till I go to college. This pandemic's the worst. 
I have to be with my family. No, no, no. When me and my brother fought, it was knuckle up, draw blood. I mean, we're, and I beat him every time. Say every time. Every time. I took dominion over his life. And then this crazy thing happened. Crazy thing. He kept growing. For those of you who are watching online, I am 6'4". I don't know why y'all are laughing. For those of you here live, I am 5'6", Mexican, and all fine. But my brother kept growing. And uh, so this one thing happened, like, um, by the time he's a senior in high school, he's benching 350 pounds. Yeah. He's squatting 585 pounds. He's a defensive tackle that can jump up and grab the rim in basketball. Let me just contextualize further. I weighed 140 pounds when he's benching 350, squatting 585. So then he gets in this, there's like this little argument where at a Carl's Jr. I don't know if you guys have this, like a burger joint. And I'm, I'm to the, almost to the car, Matthew, my younger brother, Mateo, Matthew is coming out of the, of the house, I mean the, the Carl's Jr. And this dude starts talking smack, I don't know, I don't know what the altercation was about. And I, so I look back and like, well we're from like, you from the inner city, like, you say something crazy, you're going to be accountable for those words, either in an argument and or a fight. So my brother goes and I'm looking from the other side and my brother just steps back with, on, his, on, his, on his heel and he hits this dude twice. <laughs> And the dude just drops like an accordion. And I'm sitting at the car and I'm like, now I'm serving Jesus at this time. Like I love God. Say love God. And I'm like snap, crackle, pop. So I did what any man of God would do. I just put my arm around Matthew and I just started telling tell Matthew, Matthew, you need to forgive everybody that's ever hurt you. You need to forgive everybody who's ever picked on you, who's ever beat you up. You, you have got to, listen, if you don't forgive Matthew, God can't forgive you. Matthew, you just got to forgive Matthew. Matthew, listen, you got to put it under the sea of forgetfulness, Matthew, for as far as the east is from the west, Matthew. Listen, Matthew, you're not releasing the people from what they did. You're releasing yourself from what they did. I mean, I gave him a theological prescription for application on forgiveness. Uh, you, listen, all that bitterness, uh, those, that one person who shot you point blank with a BB gun, just forgive him, me, your brother. You, forgive me for I knew not what I did. I, because I was like, listen, what I was willing to take on when he was younger, I did not want to get punched in the face by this kid anymore. I mean, he's going to bend my face in back. I'm way too pretty for all that. I'm not trying to get punched like that. I do not want to fight. And here's the reality. The devil would love to snuff out in infancy what he does not want to deal with in maturity. He would love to take out when you first receive a call. You want to know why you get fired up? up in church sometimes on a Sunday morning and by the time you're in the car mom and dad you're fighting and you're mad at the kids because the devil would love to snuff out the word in fact if you go back further in Mark, Mark chapter 4 it talks about the four types of soil because he would love to snuff out in infancy what he does not want to deal with in maturity. You're being attacked. The church, our nation is being attacked because I actually believe, and not just in some weird, uh, like, oblivious faith that just wants to say something encouraging. I actually believe the church of Jesus Christ is on the precipice of a real revival, a real expression of a people, of a move of God. I just think that this generation has so many things reminiscent of the 19th. 1960s and what was on the heels of that the Jesus people movement what was the 60s asking for peace justice freedom free love all of these things and what is this generation asking for the same things and I just believe that God is doing and he would love to get us discouraged because he would love to snuff out in infancy what he does not want to deal with in maturity but if we wait long enough if we wait say wait Isaiah 40, 31 will make all the sense. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and mount up like eagles in soar. If we wait, we see that this kingdom may start small, but it's turning into something much more significant. The text says that it becomes the largest of all the garden plants. If we wait long enough, you'll see that he's faithful to complete the work which he started in you. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. That if we wait long enough, we'll see that, yeah, sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Psalms 30, verse 5. That surely 
goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life, Psalms 23, that we'll see if we wait long enough. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 is true, that we have received from an unshakable kingdom. And everything else can be shaken, but this kingdom is undefeated. It always starts small. And here's what it says at the end of the text, that it becomes the place of provision, of solace, of shade for all of the garden animals. What you're going through is not just about you. Faith, what we're going through as a church is not just about us, there's a community. Because God will always deal with us privately and personally what he ultimately wants to accomplish through you corporately. Do you understand that he dealt with a boy on the backside of a mountain tending sheep privately because he ultimately wanted to deal with him corporately publicly as a king of all of Israel in David. Do you understand that he dealt with Joseph privately? In fact, Psalm says this, that God watched over his character until the appointed time. Joseph, the dreamer, then begins to be dealt with privately what God ultimately wanted to accomplish him corporately and save the human race. And what he's doing in us privately in this moment is he's wanting to touch your life, but he ultimately wants to birth a legacy. And he ultimately wants to birth it through a church and then a community and from a community to a city, from a city to a region and from a region to a state, from a state to a nation, from a nation to the world. Do you see that we're all part of this subversive kingdom? Upside down, inside out. This kingdom, this kingdom, if I could have the band come up. This kingdom, it always starts small. It can't be stopped. Say, can't be stopped. And it always starts small. Say, starts small. I took my first steps inside of a county jail when I was 11 months old. I wasn't in my grandmother's living room and they weren't taking pictures. I was in a visiting room in a county jail. My dad was on trial for the first of three convicted felonies he would have by the time I was eight years old. My dad begins to go in and out of prison Throughout all of my childhood, I remember the first time I saw somebody get shot, I was four years old, and the first time I saw my dad shoot up heroin, I was five. I can remember what the room looked like. I can remember that the Denver Broncos and the Oakland Raiders were on TV to the left of me, and I looked over to the right, and I saw my dad mainlining heroin into his arm. And my mom was getting tired of that, and so she got invited to this all-women's Bible study. I heard you guys have an all-women's Bible study. Get there. They started hosting them at homes during the week. So we went. My mom would take me and my brother. We would be in the back. And we, and we would, we would be, they would give us uh, Christian cartoon coloring books. And so we were coloring uh, biblical characters. And so the meeting started taking long. So I walked out of the meeting and I went into the, and the lady who was leading it, uh, she, I, I started asking, what are you guys talking about? Who are you praying to? What, what's, and in a way that I can understand, she began to explain the message of Jesus to me. Say, see? And at five years old, in a way that I could understand, I said yes to Jesus. They led me in a simple sinner's prayer, a simple prayer that I would believe in my heart, confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ was Lord, Romans 10.10. 10. And, and, and in this moment, I gave my life to Jesus, and I started telling everybody around me and all my family, I'm going to be a preacher. They were like, calmate, mijito. Calm down, little one. There's not even another Christian in your family. But I was dreaming, and I, I'm going to be a preacher. And I'd ask my mom if I could stay up and watch all the TV preachers on TV. And I would watch my, uh, this guy, Ryan Harbunke, and he would, he would preach to, to millions in Africa. All of Africa shall be saved. This German evangelist. And then I would watch another guy. If you've been in church a little while, you may know this. He was like, touch everybody, everybody. Lift up your hands. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So I'd line up all of my stuffed animals. And then I'd hit him with my hand, touch. Poof. And then he'd get slain in the Holy Ghost. Pick them up, pick them up. Serious. And I'd preach the gospel to all my stuffed animals. Say, see? Like any young person, right? They're mimicking who they admire. But God was so in seed. I said, I'm going to be a preacher. 
I'm gonna be a preacher. I would tell everybody. And by the time I'm six years old, my mom divorces my father and everything goes haywire from that moment. We get forced to live out of a car. We go from the car to homeless shelters, from homeless shelters to the projects in which I lived until I graduated and went on to be, to live on my own. We lived in Section 8 housing, food stamps, welfare, the whole bit. I am the recipient. My braces were put on by Medicaid, all of it. And it Eight years old, I find myself in a federal courtroom and my dad's being sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison. I see him cuffed walking out of that visiting room. Little did I know that was the last time I would touch my dad physically because I only got to visit him three more times and it was through a glass on a phone. And, when we, and they did allow us one visiting where we were in person, but you can't, you can't embrace. Last time I would embrace my father. 22 and a half years he missed everything I would go to sleep crying and why can't I have the cleats like so and so on my baseball team well so and so has their dad I remember feeling so insecure in high school like how do I how do I even make choices like who to marry where do I go to school I just wanted somebody to walk with me he missed everything he never saw me throw a baseball, run a football, shoot a basketball, wrestle in a match, run track. I had an uncle that was in the Navy that didn't have kids. He would send money to my mom and he would, she would sign us up for all the sports. That's why we played sports, because she couldn't afford it. And at nine and 10 years old, my mom starts moving drugs in and out of the prison system for the organized Mexican crime. I start getting raised around this gang and by the time I'm 10 years old, they're sticking a knife in my hand. They're teaching me how to stab somebody. It's really angry. So I just start acting out. And the only form of masculinity I knew, which was perverted, it was violent. It was, this is what I thought manhood looked like. And then I'm, I'm short and baby faced, but chiquito pero picoso for all the vanilla and the chocolate. That means like small, but you got spice or like dynamite comes in small. I had little man syndrome and they were teaching me to be violent. Long story short, I'm, rolling around with gangs and just trying to be like what I thought masculinity looked like. And at 14 years old, I had this crazy next-gen pastor, a woman, a single woman, a pastor's kid, not from the inner city. Let me just, this is not part of the sermon, but you do not have to relate to reach. You understand that? Love is the great equalizer. God does not relate to your sin, let he reaches you in it. Love is the great equalizer. So I don't care if you're black, you can reach a white person, I know that's taboo in 2020. If you're a white person, you can reach a black person. Love is the great equalizer. She was not from the hood, okay? Some of y'all need to sign up to be part of those kids that are, their, their parents are in prison, be a part of the prison ministry. Start, start crossing over where you don't always think you belong because you don't have to relate to, rele to reach, you have to love. So a youth pastor, not from the hood, starts reaching out to the inner city, bringing us in. Say seed. And that seed that was sown at five years old began to be sown in my life again. And I said yes to Jesus. I walked up to the gangs the, the next few days and I told them all, I said, listen, we can do whatever you want. But I'm here to tell you right now, I'm gang banging for Jesus. I ain't backing down. I ain't going anywhere. I'm here to let you know. And I just started telling everybody about Jesus. I started telling everybody. People on my football team, my wrestling team, my baseball team, they were all coming to know Jesus. And then I got asked to go on this mission trip. My youth pastor was crazy. She took us to the 1040 window after 9-11. Who does that with teenagers? My youth pastor. It was crazy. Long story. I would get my mom's food stamps. And I would buy all the ingredients to make tamales. And then we would make them. I'd pay her back her food stamps. I would sell them to go on my missions trip. I got to go to North Africa in the 1040 window without my mom paying a dime. And I remember I was at the Strait of Gibraltar, about to come from Spain into a ship to go into Morocco. And they told me, do you want to smuggle in Bibles? No one's required to do so, but we'll teach you how to put it in your backpack. And I looked at my youth pastor, I said, listen, do I get to, you're just trying to tell me, I get to be the Christian Pablo Escobar? Sign me up, I'm gangster for Jesus, West Side. You know what I'm saying? I was like, say, see. Little, man. Little did I know how far that would go. By the time I'm 18, 
My mom had sold drugs. She'd never done drugs. But in high school, she picked up a crack cocaine addiction, which then morphed into meth. So in my high school years, they were selling meth and heroin out of my house. And I was just falling in love with Jesus. In fact, a lot of the scriptures you heard me quote today, I memorized them when I was in high school. I'd put them on a three by five card and use them like flashcards. I'd stick them in my pocket. I'd read them on the way to school before wrestling practice would start at wrestling tournaments. I'd be pulling them out and, and reading them. In fact, I was so infatuated with the Bible, I would put it in a Ziploc baggie in the shower and stick it to the wall in the shower so that the, the, the flash card would not get wet and I'd st sit there trying to memorize the scripture still. Gave a whole new definition to bathing in the word. And I didn't, I didn't interpret the Bible right all the time. But I was falling in love. So you see, see, I just kept praying for my family. In fact, I cut my teeth preaching. I told pastor this in his office. With drug addicts coming to score drugs in my home in high school. They were my audience. They're the kind of who I practiced everything on. At 18, I meet my wife. 15 and a half years old, she walked into a church. And she was so unchurched that when they were raising their hands, she didn't know why. She didn't know who they were singing to. She had been to Catholic church twice, so she knew that Jesus had died. She actually didn't know that he had risen again, and she didn't know why he died. That unchurched in America. So I meet her at 16. She's in love with Jesus. We start believing God for our families together. Her mom, she grew up without a mom. Her mom was a heroin addict for 20 years. Her dad was an alcoholic. I mean, we're the perfect recipe for dysfunction. But God, say seed. We start believing God for our families. We start praying for our families. And in 2009, we get married. We start, we start a family together. And the craziest thing starts to happen. In 2009, everybody starts to come back to know Jesus. My mom then rededicates her life. She gets off of meth. And in fact, most kids, their undergrad gets paid for by their parents. But I helped my mom pay to get through her undergrad. She went from the community college to the university. And now my mom is a public school teacher. She teaches social studies and English. English for seventh grade ESL students. I'm telling you, say seed. It can't be stopped. And it always starts small. Me and Dominique start this family and we continue to go out. And I'm talking to you, revival hits our family. Everybody starts getting saved. Everybody, I mean cousins, brothers, sisters. My sister-in-law, she, she's been clean from heroin for nine years. Today my wife is planning a gender reveal for her little baby. And she's married to a Christian man and she has a great life. Come on, say seed. My mother-in-law, we got her into a teen challenge. Moved her into our house. In 11 years of marriage, eight and a half of those years, my wife and I have had a drug addict or someone fresh out of prison living in our home. We don't just have teen challenge, we have the Zamora challenge. We brought my mother-in-law in for three years. She lived with us, we loved her to life. She's married, she's serving God. And in fact, we, she had a prophecy given to her when she was in teen challenge. She said, one day your children will travel the world and preach the gospel and you will watch your grandchildren for that is your calling. And little did I know that years later when me and my wife both travel together, she watches the kids. Say seed. My brother went and got his degree in criminal justice and became a cop. That's crazy. You can throw up that picture of my family. You know, those three babies won't know fatherlessness. Those three babies won't know motherlessness like my wife knew because of this seed. Because it can't be stopped. And it always starts small. And I little did I know that little dream of a five-year-old preaching to stuffed animals would take me to 23 countries on four different continents just talking about Jesus. Say seed. I don't know where you find yourself today. Some of you walked in, you're tired walked in here exhausted you walked in here and just with with the, the, the just the embers of hope still kind of sparking but you were ready to give up would you stand to your feet but I just want to encourage you today that there is a kingdom that can't be stopped 
And it always starts small. And God is not done with your life. So we are going to corporately respond. Even when we can't see it, you're working. Don't leave. I know we went a little long. I got carried away sharing my story. Second time today, please forgive me. Can we respond? Let's worship. Let this be our prayer. prosperity preacher I do believe God wants us to be blessed I just feel a financial breakthrough for some people in this room this how many of you lost jobs your income is really decreased during COVID-19 raise your hand I see hands going up all over we you wake your way to the middle of the aisle I want people to stretch their hands up just to the middle so we can identify you your income's been affected by COVID-19 we just come to the middle of the aisle so I can see you hands going we move to the middle of the aisle your hands are up the Bible's clear locusts come and they do eat up the land COVID's here and it is eating up the land the devourer that's what the Bible says that God will repay back all that the devourer has stolen and in fact in fact the kingdom of God has the best interest rates in the galaxy better than chase will ever give you 30 60 and 100 fold it's the interest rates of heaven we just raise your hand you're in, the, you're in the middle of the aisle in the name of Jesus I pray that everything COVID-19 has stolen from you financially will be restored back to you 30 60 and 100 fold and the testimony and the story you will tell from this season is God is faithful beyond reason God is faithful beyond an economic uh, climate God is faithful beyond the the X's and O's of balancing a checkbook in the name of Jesus I declare peace sleep tonight for Jehovah Jireh your provider is still good and he's still on the throne do you believe that faith church say amen say amen man I love you I feel like we're family Pastor Larry is gonna come and end this service it can't be stopped and it always always starts small. Amen. I love you so much.
Thank you, Gabriel. Hallelujah. Let's thank God for the seed he's placed in us. Hallelujah. We thank you, mighty God, that you had to go into the ground and be planted, that you might be planted in us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you're doing. I pray, God, if there's someone here who hasn't received you yet as Lord and Savior, even now, God, may they accept that gift of everlasting life. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the word today. Hallelujah. Just have a seat for just a moment, if everybody would. Amen. Hey, let's give it up for Gabriel. What a great word. Thank you so much. Amen. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Typically in our services, if you've been coming post pre-COVID, we would always pass an offering basket about halfway through the service and receive our tithes and our offerings. And I, I know you've brought that today and came ready to give and ready to plant your seed. Well, I, I want you to do something else. I want you to just give a second offering. We're all doing it at one time. But take out, you can take out your checkbook. Put the ways to give on the screen if you would. Uh, I want you to punch in next generation or plug in, put Gabriel's name in there. What we're going to do is we're going to sow some seed for the next generation. And tonight at 6 o'clock, tomorrow night at 7, and the following night at 7 o'clock will be in a, just a dynamic youth revival, youth time together, youth conference, youth sharing together, and we get a chance to give to make that possible. Uh, kids don't have a lot of money, you know that? Uh, they just, uh, don't know, some of them do, but not a lot. And so we're going to sow into the next generation by giving a very special offering for them. So when you're making out your check, whatever, just put youth in the corner. If it's ties, put ties in the corner. We'll make sure it goes to the right place. But I want us to just give a great, generous offering, sow a seed, the next generation and see God use it to see many young men and women come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So go ahead. I'm going to pray for you right now, and then we're just going to dismiss you and let you go. we got ushers at every one of the doorways, and so they'll be there to receive your offering today. Father, we love you so much. We thank you, God, right now in advance for what you're going to do. We have fasted this week. We have prayed this week for the next generation. And now we have a chance to give to reach the next generation. And so we pray for a mighty move of God. I pray your supernatural blessings upon Gabriel as he preaches these next three nights. I pray you will continue to use him mightily and bless him and his family. We pray, God, that as this seed is planted in the ground, it will produce a great harvest of souls in these next three nights. And we'll thank you, God, for what you're going to do. And we give you the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Now, as you leave the day on your way out, there's going to be a youth table out there. Stop by and, and just meet our, our new youth pastor and meet those who are coming around. If you want to be involved in youth ministry, go sign up over there and they'll put you to work. If you're a guest, we'll meet you back in the Connect Center. Let's all stand together. God bless you. Go in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.